All right, and we are live, ladies and gentlemen. And today I am here with Addison. Addison, how are you, my friend? I'm well. How are you doing? I am doing well as well. So we've known each other for, oh my God, it's been a very long time, right? It's been, ugh, I think we met 30 what, or 20, 40 years in 30 or 40 years. years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it feels like we've, yeah, we've known each other for a very long time. It's been, I think, I think 2013, 2014, maybe that was when we so. first crossed, crossed paths. Um, so yeah. So thanks for, thanks for coming on, you know, the, the Bitcoin story show. And I would uh, maybe start with, uh, you know, the, the, the backstory. So who you are, maybe before you came across uh, Bitcoin, what you were up to and, uh, and your, your kind of lens into the world, if you will. For sure. And we were chatting about this a little bit before about mm -hmm. pre and post crypto. <laughs> and uh, that's something a lot of people say, but for me, it's actually true. It really is a sudden break in my career and the things I was doing before. But uh, I'll give you the pre-crypto story that I started off uh, in high school. I was very into programming. I did IT work, transitioned into doing paid programming work for people mm -hmm. starting by about grade 10 or 11. And a friend of mine and I, we were approached by the principal of our high school to do an online parent-teacher interview system. This was in 2003 because we were the best students in the computer science class. So they came to us to make this. And my friend and I built that system. And I'm not a part of that business anymore, but it actually still lives on. And they still run that company and it serves tons and tons of parents around the world. So that was kind of my start of Whoa. internet business. <laughs> okay, cool. And then decided for high school or for uh, university, I already had the programming side. Thought do something different, but where better to also have that programming side than going to Waterloo. So I went to Waterloo for uh, science of business originally. I thought I'd be able to combine those two and that program seemed like a really neat way to do something different. And my girlfriend then, now wife, was in biomedical sciences. That seemed like a better mm -hmm. program. So I switched into that. And uh, <laughs> most people assume I'm a computer engineer and that I did software engineering and at Waterloo, but no, I did biomedical science, but I did a lot of debating as well. That was another interesting thing. And then like lots of people in debating, saw law as a good path. Originally I was thinking med school, like lots of people in biomedical sciences. Um, it's sort of questionable whether I would have gone into med school in the end anyway, but uh, law <laughs> seemed like a better track and one where I figured I could make better use of the tech and business background than in med as well. So went off to law school. I did programming competitions as well when I was at Waterloo. And then even while I was in law school, so I competed in 24 hour hackathon competitions at the time. And that was a pretty neat thing to do. I started some internet businesses in university. And then I started another one in law school. And in my law school business that I started was after a prof who was actually a partner at one of the big law firms, gave a talk to her class about how she just happened to see this law that changed, that had a big impact on her deal. You know, and she just happened to come across it and had a huge impact on the deal. And fortunately she managed to change the deal to account for this new law. And just like your expression there, I thought, hold on a second. Are you telling me that the top lawyers in the country are just happening to come across laws that have major impacts on multi-million dollar deals? The answer is yes. And it still basically works like that in law. This is an odd idea for tech people and it wasn't for other law students. I think I was probably the only person in the class who heard that story and thought opportunity. Like, shouldn't people know about laws as soon as they happen? This is possible today, right? There's no technological reason why not. So I, I built a business around that that ended up having all kinds of customers, like a nuclear power plant as a customer, uh, various lobby groups, uh, one of the big tobacco companies as a customer. I don't know if I should mention that one, that might sound bad, but actually those guys are the best ones to deal with out of all the customers, <laughs> super nice people. And uh, I don't know, I thought it was quite legitimate work, just like lawyers working for anyone. And uh, it was really surprising to me talking with all those people and finding out 
how archaic the processes are that people follow for dealing with law. And since that time, I've started some other legal tech businesses, in part because I never want to compete with my clients, but also because this has always been a passion of mine of figuring out how to combine these two worlds and how to bring lots of the innovations that exist in the tech world into law that it still exists largely as it does in, or as it did in the 1800s. Like in many ways, even my law practice today, I work for crypto companies, but I could be doing basically the same work, you know, with a quill and paper and mailing things off just like people in the 1800s. So much of law today would be really familiar to lawyers from the 1800s, but for the tech industry, or even this video conference here, right? This is like incredible changes that have happened in the world, but not so much in the legal industry. And it's also a part of a, just a personal vision of mine, right? Of really delivering on the rule of law, really delivering on being able to have rules that mean something and be available to everyone and be accessible. And I think technology is the only way to do that. So that's interesting. That's, that's sort of my pre-crypto story. Uh, yeah, I usually try and refrain from going on too many tangents this early, but I, I do, I do <laughs> have to ask you. Okay, so like this, this idea that uh, I like uh, at one point I was I kind of thought that maybe laws are kind of the rules that humans put in place in the absence of technological uh, solutions. So just as an example, right? You're not allowed to drink and drive, but what happens, let's say 10 years from now, if I, oh, I guess this is a bad example because you're not a big fan of autonomous cars, but you know what I'm saying? What if my car drove itself? What if it was technically safer, um, you know, for the car to drive itself? Like, would that still be a law at that point in the sense that, you know, would it be a requirement if the car, and that's just like one example, but I sometimes, is that- I have a better example for you. Yeah, Speedy. yeah, go ahead. Speedy, okay, okay. I gave a professional development talk that mm. wasn't on the topic of speeding. In fact, to the Law Society of Ontario a few years ago, mm. and part of my provocative talk of the opening was saying that most of the people in this room regularly break the law murmurs from the whole crowd and everyone was so worried and looking around like who's this crazy person we invited here to speak to us was speeding and oh okay yeah and they all kind of laughed hmm. well speeding is the law but is it because nobody follows that law and there's all kinds of you know rules of thumb of oh well if you're 10 over the limit or these kinds of things right i use this example to talk to people about what really is the law there, right? Like, do people really believe that's the law? It's not enforced. It could be. And in other examples in law, it's even more the case that there's no enforcement of it. And there's an incredible number of laws that are not respected in society, and they're not designed to be respected because the government puts no money into enforcing them. There's a lot of things where there's not even a regulatory agency that's supposed to do it. There's no inspections. There's no government body you can complain to that will do anything about it. I recently read in the news about the uh, tribunal they set up, set up for dealing with air complaints involving flights. Uh, they've received more than 10,000 complaints since February, but they haven't resolved a single one since the pandemic started. Mm. And there's lots of things like that. And only working as a lawyer and sometimes for interesting clients and just my personal interest in these things have I really discovered how many things are like that? And it's an interesting role that lawyers play that they never bring up in law school of telling people what's really the law. You've got this huge body of things that appear to be the law and that the public would think are the laws, but only some of those things are really the law. Because and when you say no you use the word really, exactly, exactly. Okay, so, so th that's a very interesting point. Uh, so, hmm. So, like, you know, re again, re more recently within like the Western part of the United States, namely in San Francisco, you've seen a lot of kind of like petty crime. I don't know what, what they call it exactly, but misdemeanor or like people breaking your window when they walk down the street, essentially, for your of your car. Um, so, what I'm hearing is these types of you know, activities are no longer considered to be, I guess, or maybe they are still, it's illegal to do so, but they don't enforce it anymore. 
Um, but are, are you following kind of what's going on there? Which I find really sad because I always loved going to San Francisco. And it's like the last few times that I've been there, it just seems like there's almost been, I don't know, a kind of a change. This might be a bigger topic than itself, but. Uh, no, it's the same topic. Mm. And look at crime statistics. Robberies are way down in Canada and the mm. United States. Street crime is way down. But that's probably partly because why would criminals try and rob you, Sonny, of the 50 bucks in your wallet when they can defraud you or they can steal your bank account information and transfer money to themselves like that? And those kinds of crimes are way up. But the police haven't changed to account for that. The police are still out there just like they were in the 1800s as well, prepared to take on the robbers stealing the 50 bucks from Sonny, but they're not prepared for the business that defrauded you in a way that looks like business activity. And if you call up the police and complain about that, some of the time they'll tell you, well, that's a civil matter. We don't deal with that. As long as it's cloaked in the context of a business, it's a different thing. Wow. Okay. Lots of things are like this in society. Like <laughs> structurally, we have a system that's still in many ways for an old world. Things have changed. Mm. But our view of the law, even that people have day to day, doesn't accord with that. Right? Like what when you think you, of robbery, you... you think of me stealing your 50 bucks from your wallet. You don't think of, say, some company defrauding you and refusing you to give you a refund. What, what were the first uh, kind of like instances of law? Like, do you know that? Like when, when did law even start to show its face like on, on planet Earth? I'm just curious. Do you know? Well, that depends what you mean. Like you can look at Hammurabi's code or something like that is what people say, but that system is nothing like what we have. And in law school, they teach you different periods of law. One of the major changes that happened in the 20th century in Canada is the rise of the administrative state, where courts were replaced by administrative bodies, where in the 1800s in Canada, most problems, you'd go to court. And then people developed a new idea where the government would make these quasi-court-like bodies with experts instead of judges, and they would deal with it. And today, that's how lots of things are dealt with. But I think maybe the biggest change in things is the one that I haven't really seen people talking about, which is kind of the disappearance of law in people's life. Exactly like what you said when we first started talking about, you think it's tech, and if we can't have tech, let's go with law. Well, that's kind of what's happening, where law is disappearing from people's lives, where it's not accessible. I've talked to so many lawyers who tell me they, can, they couldn't afford a lawyer to deal with their problems. And in my own personal activism on some issues, I've tried. I actually try and file complaints sometimes. You know, that might sound like, oh, there's a fun lawyer hobby, but I, I actually really believe in a better society. I mean, that's my eternal optimism in these things, but I've actually tried and most people haven't. And if you try, you'll discover that in many areas, it doesn't exist, that these things exist on paper, but they don't exist in reality. And I think people know that. And now people are even designing businesses based around that concept, like Uber and Airbnb and these other platforms where business people have realized something that other people haven't, which is that the laws don't exist. They seem to exist. They're on paper. If you go to a lawyer, you hire them, to write you a big, long opinion, they'll tell you it exists. But then if you go out and you see what really happens, there are no taxi inspectors. There is no system. If you start an unlicensed taxi service like Uber did, it's fine. You can do it. That's basically the gist of it. I mean, they won their case against the city of Toronto, maybe due to not the best lawyering, but also because their company has been constructed in a way to make it more difficult for the government to pursue things against them because they also know the system as well in that regard. And people have now discovered this as a principle, but I don't think that knowledge is widespread in society that laws aren't all the same that they come in many varieties, but most importantly, they come in many varieties of enforcement. And this has been a major area for tech platforms for a number of reasons. One of them is that lots of laws were classically designed to go after businesses because historically, for example, it was very difficult to start a hotel business. But if you can democratize that process through technology, suddenly it's really easy to start a hotel business. And it's so easy 
that anyone can do it. And they do. And they get Airbnb. And then the government says, well, what are we supposed to do about all these illegal hotels? It's a lot easier in a world where you can know where the hotels are. You just go downtown and walk over to the hotel. And if they don't have the license, find them. But you can't do that when the whole population is running hotels and closing hotels and doing whatever they want. And that's the real genius of the people behind these platforms, not in their technology, but in spotting what the laws really are and knowing them even better than the people in government who are supposed to be enforcing those laws. Damn, we, we, we went right into the deep end, Addison. Uh... <laughs> this isn't my work. This is just my, uh, my interest here in, this, in observing what's been happening. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Oh, as yeah, someone yeah. who's worked on the tech side and on the law side, and also I see all kinds of interesting business models as part of my job, right? It, it's so apparent. But because almost no one actually has gone out and tried, right? Like the people who started Airbnb, how many people would try to start a huge taxi company that just lets anyone drive taxis. Very few people would think of doing that, right? Like it takes someone mm. particularly bold to come up with that. And if you go and hire lawyers, they tell you you can't do that. That's illegal. But you can't. They did. It's a huge company. Um, I don't even fact, know if I should share this one. House, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's. Let's just say someone uh, really wise once told me that it's it's not about breaking the law. It's about bending it. And so it's it's uh, it's about learning what they are, so that you're not you know on the wrong side of enforcement at the end of the day. Um, but at the same time, you know, making sure that oh man, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Hey, but Addison, I just realized we we haven't really defined, I guess, kind of like what. Well, well, let's maybe dive a little bit into the crypto stuff, right? So, how would you how would you kind of summarize your I don't know, service you're offering to the world. Like uh, uh, you're like a crypto blockchain lawyer uh, of sorts. Uh, and how did That's that all That's kind of what I've be? gone with the last few years. Right, I'm right, more right. of a project lawyer though. I'm a little bit mm. of a, what lawyers maybe call fractional general counsel, but I may be more of a project lawyer or product lawyer. My job is to help people who've got great new ideas in crypto to figure out how to bring that product to market and how mm. to keep it in the market by following the laws, despite my somewhat off topic philosophizing a minute ago. And what was one of your first projects? There really big are projects. lots of laws that are enforced. And what was one of your first big projects in this space? Like one of those like exciting technical projects? Uh, well, I keep a really open mind about things. Mm. And I've worked for lots of small companies that never became big companies, but I mean, they could have they had interesting ideas. In the crypto area, really my first client here was um, Anthony Diorio's company that he was starting where he was trying to create a physical location for decentralized technologies in order to have a place for people to go and meet and to incubate ideas and to be a co-working space. And the idea was that he would just be able to help these ventures grow. And when I first spoke with him, the idea wasn't so much beyond that but he knew there was something here and that if you could connect the right people, this, this was great stuff. Um, and that was quite the insight. And in parallel to this, he was also a co-founder of Ethereum, which I then started working for as well. Mm. So working with the Ethereum team in the early days was really that. And they were a small group of people. And I think a lot of people read magazines and things like that and think people's destiny is written on day one, but that's not the case. Like with early stage companies, even great projects like Ethereum, no matter how smart you see the people are, you never know where these things are gonna go. I didn't mm -hmm. think Ethereum was a slam dunk would become second to Bitcoin and market cap on the rankings and the area for decentralized applications that people have focused on over the last few years. It, it's actually kind of amazing to me because it started off small right? And started off at the ground floor like everything does. And that's mm. probably the case, I would think, with just about everyone that works with big companies you've heard of with fast growth, or in this case, not really a company, more of a protocol, but the people around it too, like they started 
like everyone else. And, and actually, what was it about the project that caught your intellectual curiosity, if you will? Like, what 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 was it? The Turing completeness? Was it? Uh, I don't know. Was it just Anthony's excitement mostly? Was it like I don't know? Were you able to see something that maybe many others missed there, or what? What, what was the key insight that, that really captivated you? The insights were all theirs. That's not me. I played a very small right. role in no, helping what? to do legal things. Right. But uh, amazing idea of having a world computer and decentralizing mm. computing. I, I mean, there have been attempts like that before. I hadn't heard of them at the time. That's an amazing concept. The idea of having things running on a blockchain where you have computer programs running on it that can do things instead of having things in centralized servers that's a really big paradigm shift mm. and a totally different way of looking at things. And cloud computing became much bigger after the founding of Ethereum. It's still really big. And we're still not in a world where computing is being done within a blockchain context. But a fascinating idea of decentralizing computing, right? It's, it's a different model. And I think has a lot going for it. It's turned out to be even more technically complicated than they anticipated. I mean, Ethereum has been a big success, but many of the things they thought about in the early days were just not there yet, right? But the ideas have endured and there's lots and lots of projects working on the same kind of concept today with, with all kinds of angles on it. I, I'm still really captured by this concept. Mm -hmm. uh, so on that point, just curious, so, uh, there are a lot, I mean, DeFi is kind of like the new big thing, right? Everybody's talking about it. Um, I'm just curious. So do you, do you have any like uh, uh, thoughts on, on what's happening now in, in the DeFi space? Are you, are you um, I don't know, mostly just staying away from it? Are you paying close attention? Like, where are you on that spectrum? Paying close attention. I've done some work in it. The problem with that label, like lots of things in crypto though, is it includes such a big range of things from things that are definitely decentralized or mm. already decentralized all the way to some that aren't at all. And mm. they use that label to talk about, to be generous to them, like the decentralized aspects of what they use for their transactions. So mm. stable coins or Bitcoin or something like that, that you deposit, right? That's how many of them operate, but those aren't, decentralized like they are decentralized to a degree but they're not decentralized finance of the type that i was just talking about about like a world computer that operates like that they still have many centralized functions in part because you have to if you want to run a lawful business um, for some types of lending things like that and corporations you know all those sorts mm. of things but also because that is a much easier model Truly decentralized finance is pretty elusive because that's a complicated area. Decentralized technologies are really complicated to work with. People think these things are simple and solve problems, but they're not. They're things that really smart people have been working on for years. And they've been able to crack that in some ways, but there's always a spectrum of decentralization. Mm. Few things are truly at that, you know, decentralized autonomous organization kind of level, which is, I think, a point of confusion with lots of people because some of these things might be possible, but we're not there yet. And then the public here is DeFi and they think that's what they're getting, but that's not really how they operate. Mm, mm, and like yeah. everything to lots of bad actors as well. This area yeah. is innovative and exciting lots of great ideas, but they're complicated and many people can't tell the difference between the good ones and the bad ones. Sometimes I can't, right? Like mm. it's very hard to tell sometimes until you get under the hood and look at it, right? Mm. And even still, like you, you don't really know unless you have a good understanding of, you know what I mean? Like technical matters and like legality. And it's, it's like, there's so many moving pieces that it's hard for, for even like experts or like people who've been in the space forever to make uh, educated decisions. And if it's on a global basis, impossible. impossible. No one can tell you what the laws are in the world. There's too many, exactly. they're unknown. Yeah, yeah. I, I get this question all the time. Oh, do I have to follow all the laws in the world if I have a global business? Mm. You have to follow all the laws where your customers are usually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. huge challenge 
actually like an undefined problem because you can't know what the laws are in lots of countries. Yeah. Really interesting, though, that you brought up Uber as well. Like our, our lawyers uh, in India, Initiate Design Associates, I remember like five years ago, uh, gave us a, some, some, some reading material, if you will, on, on kind of the, the case there and all and, and kind of the, the precedent set. Um, very interesting. Hey, I was going to ask you, so just so, so I guess before you even became kind of like the Ethereum lawyer uh, and worked at Decentral, there must have been a point in time where you um, fell down the rabbit hole and I don't know, maybe got a bit obsessed with Bitcoin and all that. I'm just curious, like, was there like before you even met Anthony, was there a point in time where you you're like, okay, I'm going to like, you know, make a commitment to this industry or to this space and, and make the, the, the leap over, or was that a bit of a gradual process? Yes and no. Yes. When I was a law student, I read, uh, I think it was in Wired, maybe the article about mm. Silk Road. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the idea of a drug dealing marketplace didn't interest me very much, but the Bitcoin side did. Mm. Hold on a second. Internet money? <laughs> That's different. And not PayPal. <laughs> like something where you're really transacting value with software? Totally different. It was just a break from previous things. And maybe if I was smarter, I could have figured out some sort of business angle on that for myself. But no, I just thought that was interesting. Um, at the time, I was kind of sucked into the law student rat race of articling and how to become a lawyer, because you need to work for another lawyer for at least 10 months to become a lawyer. Mm. So you've got to get through that. And once I did, then I opened my own law practice. And within, I don't know, maybe six months of starting that, suddenly I was working on crypto work. And now that's 100% of what I do. <laughs> interesting and it's been, a, it's been for quite a few years an interesting road as well right like uh yes so so i mean if you were to sum it up then i guess you're you're like a guy who's been you know very well versed in programming and kind of like technical matters very entrepreneurial uh became a lawyer and then essentially started working on you know wow that's crazy that's like uh, and i think the key reason anthony hired me mm. is that i was the only person they interviewed who had done any mining. Mm. This was in 2013 that I was playing around with crypto mining, not to make money on it, just as a really interesting thing. And mm. I bet the number of lawyers in Canada in 2013 who had done any kind of crypto mining and understood what was going on, <laughs> very small, not zero, <laughs> but there's very few people. So yeah, yeah, I guess yeah. in that sense, I was probably the only candidate, but. So, I mean, I guess, it, I mean, like, look, I, I've been a, 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 like, you know, a Bitcoin entrepreneur for, for some time. And if there's one lesson that I've learned is that it's important to have, um, you know, a lawyer or lawyers on your side that are, you know, curious, right. That aren't just going to be like, well, you know, these are the written words on a book somewhere that was written like 500 years ago. It's like, you know, it's more about, okay, like understanding, like the law, the legal system, but also understanding like the reasoning almost kind of behind laws and also extrapolating to that other extreme angle of like enforcement. Most, and Most hmm. lawyers can't do that though. Because if you work at a big law firm where I articled, you don't have time for that. Hmm. I've spoken to lawyers who do this kind of work at big firms and this is what they all say because there's such immense pressure to build. And I, as an independent lawyer, could spend however much time I want learning about these things and talking to people and going to meetups. Mm. And I think that's a key difference. And I think that's why there's a fair number of independent lawyers who've ended up becoming rather well-known in this because you might think, oh, wait, you'd think it would be the big guys who get into this obviously huge growth industry. But a lot of the people are actually people from smaller firms. Some of them now work at big firms, but I think that was sort of required Mm. At least a few years ago, because otherwise, how do you justify spending all your time learning about this weird technology with all these strange people in it and hearing about all these scams <laughs> and weird stuff? You know, that's not very amenable to working at a fancy law firm. And, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit of a problem with the law profession that lawyers view their job as just being about the law. But that's not how business people view law. 
It gets a, a part of their business, right? It's not a separate thing. And they want lawyers who understand the business and the context of it. But many lawyers are really resistant to this idea. And it's not a part of the culture of lawyers, at least in Ontario, to regard their jobs as not just being good at the law, but also being good at what their clients are up to. Mm. But I think that's essential. And um, when I worked at, uh, I worked at Blackberry as a summer student. Mm. And in my downtime, because I was a summer student and they didn't have so much work for me to do all the time, I, uh, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't admit on your show to some of my strange hobbies, but my, uh, I guess, hobby while I was at work there was they had this uh, directory system of all the internal websites at Blackberry. And there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them for all these different projects. And I was actually in the regulatory division, the Blackberry, even though I worked in the tech licensing group. So I had unusually high permission access and I would just go through the directory and read what's going on in the company in all these different areas, upcoming products, hardware development, and read about how the hardware teams are approaching this supplier problem or what kinds of things people are working on in this aspect of the company. And I really encourage people to do that kind of stuff because by the end of the summer in the meetings in the tech licensing group, sometimes people would be talking about some project or code name or something about what's going on. And they say, like, <laughs> oh, well, you know, what is this? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, you know, that's a part of this and this and this, of this project. People are so surprised because like, <laughs> well, how does the summer student know that? And it yeah. wasn't confidential information. I just read what was there. And most, <laughs> most people, people don't do that. <laughs> no, but yeah. if you yeah. read what's there, and you know what's going on, you'll do a better job of the law because especially for commercial work, like how can you work on business deals for people if you don't know how their deals operate, if you don't understand the parameters of their business, if you don't understand what to go back to the people and say, hey, have you considered doing this other thing? And that's what people want. They don't really want a, a book about how their contract could be in some alternative world, right? Or here, bunch of quotes from bulk sales act or something right they, they want actionable things and those actionable things have to relate to the business law is like an independent thing i think it's sort of a fantasy for many areas of law and not very useful what is the definition of law oh, there's lots of books <laughs> about that it's contested yeah but is it like a, is there like a one-liner elevator pitch <laughs> It's, it's, it's like what it's like is it a set of like i mean if you had to try and describe it like uh a set of rules that we all abide to follow by follow um well one of my friends has a phd uh, in law and we chat about this and he has a much broader view of it yeah. than i do <laughs> yeah i usually think of law as being like acts regulations court decisions decisions of administrative bodies to some degree um that is what most lawyers deal with and what they consider to be the law. But many people see law as being broader. Like my friend with his PhD in law, particularly in regulation, he sees it as being broader and that it includes regulatory guidance, um, like speeches by ministers or people who are in a position to affect how laws are interpreted or enforced about their priorities, like reports they publish about strategic priorities for the year that most um, government agencies in Canada publish. There's no real line though between what's law and what's not. And I think it's, as they're saying, like I don't think it's a very useful way for lawyers to consider their work, but there is a definition that is relevant to your insurance and regulation of lawyers. Hmm. Interesting. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, very. And, and these are contested. Um, and here, to give you a fun example of these areas being contested, there's a somewhat famous case from a few years ago about equine dentistry in Alberta, which is a horse dentistry, and about whether that's the practice of veterinary medicine. And there's different decisions in Canada and other countries about whether equine dentistry counts as veterinary medicine or not. And it makes a huge difference because lots of farmers can't afford to have vets come and brush their horse's teeth, but teeth with horses with poor oral hygiene apparently suffer from various problems. And why sh shouldn't you be able to pay someone 
who's not a vet to come brush your horse's teeth. So if you want to know about how professional services are contested, there's a good one to look for how ridiculous this can get. But I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but it has a huge impact to the people involved, but, 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 right? Uh, yeah. When, when do these even come up, though? Like, is it like, like you said, is it uh, is it some politician had enough people complain to him about his horse's teeth? By the way, did you see that? <laughs> is that We're just me home. imagining me imagining something? <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> oh my God! There's two things behind me. You guys, I want to call. This oh is my God! COVID nineteen edition. Yeah, they they just kind of uh, pile in every now and then. They're I consider them my co-hosts. Um, but yeah, no, I'm just uh, no. But how did that even come about? Is like these regulations at the end of the day are they are they just a function of like a politician has enough people complain to him and then he just goes and makes some noise online and media. I'm going to pause this and, and make some moves here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. And we're back. So that can, that can be fun, uh, but a bit distracting. Anyway, so yeah. Um, okay, anything else you want to share, though? I guess kind of like before I, I change gears, anything else you want to change, uh, share about, I, I don't know, your practice, about... about um, more like current things that that me, people should be thinking about when it comes to let's say crypto and kind of the legal because I mean like like, like it, to me it's just like like my brain goes haywire and like I have short circuits when I think about like tech and legal coming together because like you said legal is like jurisdictional and tech and especially blockchain is kind of global and there's all these like weird like abstractions where in Bitcoin, it's like, if you were to ask me, where is your Bitcoin? You could technically say it's everywhere and nowhere and kind of be right. Like there's all these- I've like, done professional <laughs> speaking with this consulting group of lawyers yeah. and professors and things for regulators. They have the same questions. I usually right. don't have as good gestures as you do about it, but you know, they're a little more uh, professional yeah. about it, but <laughs> they're also puzzled. No matter how professional they are, people don't have good answers on these things, right? They're new. But I think they're a part of this general challenge that I was talking about earlier. That wasn't entirely off topic about the disconnect between old laws and new reality, that these things are happening and they're global. And the old model of regulating within our country and thinking of Canada as an island, it wasn't really true before. It's really not true now. It's just not the case. Um. So we've had some interesting, I guess you could say, cases, right, in, in Canada. Um, I'm not sure if that's something that we can talk about much, but we've had some interesting situations, let's say. Like, for example, Quadriga is something that's fairly public that I think people are aware of, right? And I think it it it, it brings up this kind of this whole question of like you know, like who should have been more responsible or who should have been more, you know, on top of it in terms of like regulating the right characters and um, and kind of through regulators and, and, and lawmakers into a bit of a frenzy, right? Like, cause now there's this like, I don't, anyways, I'm just curious to know, like, do you have any thoughts on-, on, on There's what, no regulation that stops fraud. There are some things that reduce fraud. No industry has succeeded in eliminating fraud. And that's not a cop out about this question. Mm. And Quadriga is a huge problem for people. And it's very frustrating for me as a lawyer too, to hear about these things, because I have clients who spend lots of money and time thinking about things and trying to do a good job. And then there's all these other people out there that save all the money on lawyers and all the money on everything else. And then they steal the money. <laughs> there's a lot of fraud. And it's not just in crypto though. There's a lot of fraud in other areas. Too, right? Like fraud is a common reality that people experience. Like whether it's small time stuff, like I, when I've given talks before, I ask people, you know, who here has had their an unauthorized debit card transaction where somebody's debit card credentials have been stolen, right? It's rampant. These things are really common today about different kinds of frauds, whether they're small time like that or really big ones. Um, giant financial frauds and the financial crisis even with the most regulated entities. And that's not to say crypto doesn't have its problems. In fact, there's 
probably few industries that have as many fraudulent companies, in part because I think the difference is hard to tell between Quadriga CX and all the good virtual currency dealers and exchanges. And the good ones also have to adopt some of the tactics of the bad ones to compete with them. So they all look kind of similar and the fraudulent ones copy the good ones too. And it's really hard for people to tell the difference. And with internet businesses, anybody can be doing these things too. It's not really like a store where you might go into the store and, you know, a, a fake Walmart that has nobody working there, you know, and you go in and half the lights are off and you say, oh, no, I'm not interested in this, right? But it's much less apparent with okay, internet so I, businesses. I, I, I get what you're saying. It's hard. But how do people tell? What do people need to do? Like, uh, yeah. I mean, so, so if, if you're saying regulations and laws will never fight fraud, then I assume- No, they can fight fraud. You just can't stop fraud. You can't, you can't stop put it. 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 Right. And so regulations only... have a cost too. So where are you going to fall on that, right? Like most stores in Canada are very lightly regulated, not because they don't do lots of bad things, but because the cost of regulation is so high and maybe also because stores are a fairly powerful lobbying group. But- in most areas of a Canadian economy, there's very little law that directly regulates their business activities. And it's because of the trade-offs. So the question in this area is, are the trade-offs worth it? And as of June 1st in Canada, anybody who's a virtual currency dealer now has to register with FinTrack. Um, would that stop someone from also running a fraud? Probably not. FinTrack regulation is more about anti-money laundering than mm -hmm. anti-fraud. So fraud but is something kind of that I think entrepreneurs, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Well, for one, even if we did bring in the world's greatest regulatory system for this in Canada, well, Canada's not an island. And right now, lots of people use foreign exchanges. So would that end? If you can't put a stop to the foreign exchanges, it doesn't matter what system you put in place. Because as much as people bring up Quadriga in Canada, there's been lots of other big frauds in other countries too. We're not uniquely prone to this kind of fraud, right? Another problem here too, though, is that this industry has been pushed away from legitimacy because people never regarded it as a very good one. Banks are allergic to cryptocurrency, even today. Hmm. And when that happens and you get pushed out of all the mainstream things, and even a number of years ago, lots of lawyers wouldn't do work to do with cryptocurrency. Now it's a lot more mainstream and there's big firms with partners who call themselves blockchain lawyers. That's a real thing now, <laughs> but it wasn't before. And there were lots of people who said, oh, I don't deal with those kinds of things mm. because they thought it was too sketchy. It was a reputational problem for them. Same with cannabis and other things like that before. Now they have cannabis groups at all the big law firms. You know, Once there's enough money and seeming legitimacy, lawyers get into it and other people do too. Now, cannabis companies are on stock exchanges and get bank accounts. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that with virtual currency about the legitimization of it over time as more and more big companies get into it. And people associate big companies with good and small companies with bad. So as things make that transition, you'll see more banking become available. And I think as that happens, you'll start to see this fraud risk go down as well. Mm. Because, kind of in, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Because banks have their own controls as well. Part of the problem with Quadriga CX is they did offshore banking and they used sketchy payment processing intermediaries to juggle their money around. They even had cash deliveries and cash pickups. And they mm. did that because they were pushed out of the banking system by de risking for partly anti money laundering reasons. And that creates a problem for people in the industry too. Because if at that time, you had a choice between the mainstream ones that could have had proper bank accounts and had proper lawyers and proper accountants that were attesting to things on their website. And then you had Quadriga CX that offers to come pick up your cash in a backpack. Which one are you going to use, right? And then you'd have stronger signals. So I don't think there's really one answer here. I think it's a lot of factors. Uh, yeah, no, it's definitely a quagmire of a situation. Um, I also once wonder how regulators are incentivized to, to ensure 
you know, like what are their incentives, for example? Um, you know, if someone comes up with a set of laws, uh, you know, and that law goes on to prevent, let's say, job creation, are they actually like penalized for it? No. So then it almost seems like then they're to some extent they're they're coming up with laws that are more just like oh well like quadriga for example now you know shit hits the fan and now it's time to uh regulate and come up with rules right and and so it like i'm just wondering is so i guess how, how do entrepreneurs like affect change positively in this space like you know because it almost feels like in in like in a vacuum you know, bad things happen as well. Simultaneously as entrepreneurs, you're not, you don't want to be like, oh, well, let's go educate all the regulators because you have a product to build and find product market fit. People have money. People have put incredible time into speaking with people in government. And I think that's actually rather unfair the way they demand time of people as well. Many of these government agencies or provincial securities regulators, not appreciating what you just said about startups and that they don't have unlimited money. Maybe the fraudulent ones have unlimited money because they don't have to pay anyone, but the real companies doing this stuff, they have budgets, they have constraints, right? Like this industry is not as rich as people think it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh man. And it, it shouldn't be, right? Like the goal of tech people, lots of them, is how can we bring the cost down to basically zero? Hmm. That's people's dream, right? How can you bring virtual currency to everyone at basically no cost? Hmm. I've talked to lots of people in this industry where that is their goal. Hmm. There's people yeah. I've talked to who they would be okay with going out of business if it meant that everyone in Canada could access virtual currency for free. They think, yeah, that's great. Shut down my business. I'll do something else in tech. I'd love to see it. Hmm. You don't really find that kind of goodwill in other sectors, right? There's a lot of true believers and passionate people in this. Hmm. Yeah. Like something. yourself. Yeah, 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 definitely. Uh, took the orange pill um okay so we were I've, kind of... I've seen you do many things that are not for your personal interest <laughs> yeah yeah i yeah uh, definitely definitely find bitcoin to be super interesting and oh i just can't even think about doing anything else you know and it's been almost eight years now for me but i don't know i don't know it just feels like like you said you know like a singularity event of some sort like some sort of like moment where you know, oh, but like humanity will, I'm sure, look back to and be like, whoa, like that happened. <laughs> like it's a good thing that happened. Um, hey, I was going to ask you, so you've been probably following some of this like micro strategy public company, put half a billion dollars into Bitcoin, Square put 50 million, and now it's becoming like kind of a trend, if you will, maybe uh, with two data points, uh, say, com public companies saying that, you know, that they want to, like that they kind of, I guess, see Bitcoin as like a better hedge against inflation. I don't know what reasons they are or they're using, but any thoughts on, on that recent development? I thought it was pretty exciting. Well, lawyers think they're qualified to talk about everything under the sun, but this is not my area of work. I don't, I don't really know their strategy on that or what's going to happen with inflation. Who knows? But uh, it's growth. It has been steadily, right? And I can't tell you how many times over my career, People have said, oh, well, isn't Bitcoin dead? I talked to a major law firm a few years ago where I was contemplating joining them if they were keen on taking this on and really dominating this industry and putting the resources that are necessary into it. And managing partner there said, eh, well, I don't know, this crypto thing, is this really going to last? Yes. Love that. It has. Yeah. <laughs> it's only grown bigger every year. There's yeah. ups and downs for sure, but every year it's bigger. Even if prices go down one year, I've never seen things stop. There's just an expansion of this industry and more and more people looking at these ideas. And the ideas are diffusing into other industries too, where people are seeing these concepts and they're not unique to cryptocurrency. Like the people who made Bitcoin weren't, you know, God handing it down from on high, right? They combined existing technologies in a really creative new way to make something amazing, but they didn't invent public private key cryptography. Right? Like mm -hmm. They didn't invent these things, but Bitcoin has helped popularize some of these things and inspired people in adjacent industries 
and given people a new focus on having good quality records, the idea that you can have records that are properly authenticated, you could do that before. It's possible. It's different ways. But these ideas are now a lot more mainstream of the mm. approaches because people have seen the power of them, right? As well as virtual currency developments themselves. Hey, 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 yeah, I got to ask you a question. What, what are your thoughts on the whole code is law statement? You know, that, that I guess Ethereum was running with back in the day. Like, I mean, just as, as someone who's, you know, kind of... A, half tech, half legal uh, guy, just wondering, was that, did you think that they kind of overstepped maybe their, the, like oh, kind of under promise over deliver uh, the opposite of that rather uh, type of deal? Or do you think that no, it was does. aspirational? Mm, sorry? The law does that. They mm. didn't. Law over promises and under delivers dramatically in people's lives in Canada and other countries every day. People are disappointed to find out that the law is not what they thought it was, that the law is not there for them, that they can't understand it, that the government doesn't listen to them, the government doesn't do anything. That's the part that overpromises and under delivers. The code delivers, it delivers every time. It works great. People love these things, right? Like look mm. at technological innovation that's just fired around the world. Somebody makes some new service, suddenly you've got 20 million users. You have mm. amazing new innovations, right? Look at all the amazing things that have happened in tech over the last 20 years. Like we, we live it, but it's spectacular, the changes that have happened in tech, right? But you can't say that about law. Hmm. So I think people complain far too much about the crypto people talking about these ideas when really their complaints should be addressed to the legal system and the way that law is really experienced by people because it's not there for them, but the code is. So this idea like, oh, is the code law? Well, from a practical perspective, it may be much better. I'd probably rather have the code than have the law. If the law doesn't work for me and if it's not there for me, but the code is. And even better if the code's free. The law is usually not free. So code, so code is not law, but law is code now. <laughs> if only. I don't know. I don't know. You I don't, don't even know. deliver it like that. <laughs> Oh, man. You know, another thing that I was really um, kind of intrigued by, you know, with the whole situation in India with the RBI and the Supreme Court, um, I'm not going to lie, at one point, it seemed like even though we had taken all the right steps and did everything we thought was the right move, it felt like we were not going to, um, you know, win. And in the end, it was our fate was somewhat in the hands of the lawyers, which did a spectacular job, by the way, of like, uh, you know, kind of presenting the case, obviously, um, but ultimately with the judges. And that's something that, again, I, I just confess, I don't know a lot about, but like, I, I just like walked away from that experience with a mental note of like, so you need, you need to learn a bit more about like judges, like who the hell are these people? Like how, is it just that we got lucky and got a few that were maybe a bit more grounded in, you know, in like uh, just like uh, common sense. And in, so, so therefore, or was it bigger than that? Is there something that maybe I don't understand about the world um, and judges are tend to be these like arbiters of truth and, and like, who are they? Like, how do they even come to be? <laughs> Is my question. I don't know if you know that. Well, India has lots of good judges, but they Canada's do. judges, mm. excellent. Hmm. I. It's very rare that I read a legal decision and I think, oh, that's bad judging. Very rare. They're usually great within the context of the system and the rules as they exist. Even if the outcomes are disastrous, I disagree with them on some things. <laughs> you don't read the decision and think it's bad lawyer, bad judging. Right. And judges in Canada generally get their jobs because they're good lawyers and they understand the law. And, but most people never get to court. It's extremely rare that any problem you experience will ever be before a judge. Even criminal matters. Most people think that TV is real and that they get to go before a judge and, you know, get to have a lawyer who presents their arguments and make their case. They don't. Over 90% of criminal cases in Canada or a deal you make, a settlement agreement with the government where you agree to go to jail and agree to go to jail for a certain number of years, it's called plea bargains. That's how almost everything is resolved in Canada and the United States today. 
very, very few people will go to court. And even the number of people that go to court isn't known. But I saw recently the estimate is it's something like five to eight percent in Canada of criminal cases actually go before a judge and have a trial. Most people don't. People think that's what happens, but that's even things that get that far. Most things don't even get that far. It took nearly two years for us to actually have our case read and or like heard or whatever. Um, and and it was, I think, the second time in like history that the Supreme Court had ever overruled the RBI. Um, but, I, but I also wonder... Uh, but you guys were really right, for one, and you paid for it too, right? You had the money and the willpower to push that forward and really wanted to win. Many people, when faced with these kinds of things, they don't because they decide it's not worth it. Do we want to invest a million dollars, two million dollars into our? Lawsuit? I agree with you. I agree with you, and I think one of my reasons for kind of doing these, like, uh, whatever these interviews, and just generally, is to kind of let more people know that this is possible, like what just happened, you know, and that they shouldn't be scared uh, if they I encourage feel like that they're too. doing the right thing. Yeah, exactly. If they feel like they're doing the right thing, but it's hard. Well, it's super I, hard. I consider my job actually keeping people out of court. <laughs> because they're doing bad things yeah, when it yeah, comes yeah. to the government taking action against them mm. yeah people should push back and well I, I but i guess the deeper point i was going to get at is is that all those people then who were let's say right but just didn't have the willpower or finances to fight are they just being shut out of the system absolutely yeah the, like and there's lots system. of stats like there's really tons of stats system. on this yeah, this system seems really and like it's working for the people. Even big high stakes <laughs> things like family law now, the majority of people in Ontario in divorce cases don't have lawyers. It's weird. And these are the people who get to go to court. And, and dude, I've even had, even in my them. personal life, like when I've had a few things happen, like forget these big matters, like little things where I've had a guy pull a knife on me one time in, in downtown Toronto. Police get to the scene, the guy gets taken away, they take my report, never to be heard again. It's been like 10 years or whatever. But like I've had three, four instances like that where there's this like big hoopla, but then there's like zero follow up, <laughs> which makes me go like, wait, so that means you can just do whatever the hell you want. And, and this whole thing of this veneer of law is really just a veneer. I was a witness to a crime as well in Toronto. And the police, when they showed up, said, oh, does anybody want to say what happened? Looking around and like, yeah, sure, I will. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's really good. Most people don't want to talk to us. Don't don't want to say anything. Like, well, I wasn't involved, and it's like I'm I'm happy to. <laughs> Apparently, lots of people aren't, but um, I actually missed testifying for this. I was supposed supposed to go and somehow missed it on my calendar and called them right before when it was. And the phone number I was given for doing this, the people said, oh yeah, don't worry about it. Like it probably doesn't matter anyway. And probably they pled guilty and I don't even know if it's happening anyway. And if it's a real problem, someone will call you later and they never did. So I, I don't know, but um, many things actually things, are good. Dude. I'm being really negative here on this. No, no, no. Uh, the problem I isn't really like things like that. The problem I think is more on the civil side, like people who are defrauded uh, because like the things that you're talking about, like street crime or the obvious crimes like that, you know, I think a lot of the stuff really does get dealt with one way or the other. I mean, it's all the things that don't get dealt with that concern me a lot more. All the things that are never in the news because the people never go to court or because they don't think they have the money or because they don't think they'll win or all the administrative bodies or agencies that are supposed to enforce things, but don't. My, uh, oh, here, I'll give you another personal example. I, uh, my wife and I reported some people burning tons of plastic up north in uh, you know, like a backyard incinerator, which is a really common thing in rural areas in Ontario even today. People just take all the trash and burn it in a fire, right? In like a barrel. And we called up the environment ministry people and uh, they said, oh, well, they're probably burning it because it's too difficult to take it to the dump. Sorry, aren't, aren't you the environment people? Are, 
you know, like, I, I didn't call you for you to tell me why they're burning the garbage. It's like, I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is allowed or not. I'm, I'm not an environmental lawyer, but it's definitely bad for people to be burning plastic around children in big fires like that. And I mean, maybe that's a fair answer. It's too hard to take to the dump, so you should burn it. I don't think so, but definitely I don't expect the people from the environment ministry to do that when people complain. I mean, that's like a really petty example. I mean, real things though, where you try to do something like access to information requests, often the government just ignores them, fails to provide the answers. Um, I don't know, in lots of areas, right? Like, we, the show we, could go we, on we, for hours about... And, and I said we had done that, by the way, in the midst of this whole court case, um, and that we did an access for information, and we got it, and we got signals that you know they were trying to essentially squash this industry into oblivion, you know, or into non-existence. <laughs> uh, anyways, just another awesome point that you know makes me feel good about humanity. It, it just feels well, the, like the real point, though, is about yeah. <laughs> which things are real, right? Which parts What's of the real? legal system mm. are enforceable? Which laws that are how does one know box? that? Is there like a is there like a website or something? Like how do people know? There isn't. Uh, <laughs> lawyers usually know though. Lawyers in specialty areas, they usually know which things you need to follow and which things you don't. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay, dude. <laughs> but wow. then there's the entrepreneurs who say, "Well, that's interesting, lawyer, but we're just going to go for it anyway." Hmm. And then sometimes they change things. Now ride sharing services have become legalized all over the world, right? Hmm. Not everywhere, but they made a big difference. Yeah, and I always think I think about that is like how, like how does that happen? Like, how, and and you you brought up cannabis as well, right? In Canada, like five years ago, it was literally illegal, or whatever. Two years ago, I think it was it was illegal. Uh, I have a friend who was charged in high school with cannabis offenses and went to see. court. Today, the government will deliver cannabis to you with free shipping next day in Ontario during the pandemic. <laughs> well, there you go. They may not respond to your access service. information request, but they will sell you drugs. <laughs> so, so, so I, don't, I don't know. But no, but it went from like, you will go to jail for doing this thing to we will keep it on at all costs and deliver. You know what I mean? But nothing changed in between that point and this point. Yet these people are technically martyrs. Maybe that's not the right make word. make you like skeptical of people's moral claims about the law the fuck okay but that's what i mean like like we're living through it right like okay you're, you're a or bitcoiner you're a criminal a different now example it's like, I use ah, with people uh, is laws in other countries people think oh our laws are moral and good well other countries have different laws with different rules and different systems mm -hmm. they're not worse or better I mean, sometimes they are but there are different systems to cover the same human conduct and we could have different systems like the way things work right now is not the only possible way. It might seem like it, but then if you go and look at other legal systems, you, that just doesn't stand. Right? I, I find like one of the main challenges that not just like, like lawmakers and regulators have, but I think almost everyone unanimously has is that they try and view Bitcoin as like something that they already know. You know what I mean? Like they try legal is thinking. It, is, it, is it like a stock? Is, is that what it is, Addison? Is it a stock? Is it, or is it like a like? Is it like is it gold? You know? Is it in, money? In fairness, a lot of people have marketed crypto like that. That's part of the problem. Right, right, right. And, and that's what I'm saying. marketing really and, confuses people. And I think I, I I can identify with that. Is that like people are trying to like you know create analogies to help people understand. But what people fundamentally miss is that it is not, it's not digital gold. It's not like gold turned into ones and zeros. <laughs> it's something totally different. It's like analogous to like the internet compared to like a TV screen. You know what I mean? It's like, yes, it kind of looks the same, you know, it's the same shape, but what's actually happening behind the scenes is night and day. What's um, an email? Mm, what's an is email? That property? Mm. Well, there's copyright in the email maybe. And email is a really good example for regulatory, too, because there's very few laws about email. Mm. Up until the anti-spam law came in in Canada, even though email is how everyone does all business and is probably one of the most transformative business technologies of the last 50 years, there aren't really any laws about it. Mm. 
pretty wild. Uh, okay, okay. I say, uh, we should definitely do this again. Um, but I, I got. I, I want to ask you a couple more questions before we, you know, wrap up because I think we maybe some crypto minutes left. Crypto related law. Oh uh, yeah, we can, we can we can go in whatever direction you want. I think they're want. related, but. Crypto related, like I said, I can. I, I, if you want to go deep into any particular, like you know, whether it's um, yeah, What's any particular question? thing. What do you think I mean, would so, be helpful for people to know? So my next question is: so uh, we already covered like two of my big ones. My next question is: is uh, you know, what is one thing that you believe to be true that most others would may perhaps disagree with you on, right? Within the uh, let's say open blockchain community, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So what's like a contrarian belief, if you will, that 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 you again see it as like, wow, this is super important and and true, but most others would be like, dude, you're you're off your rocker. Like something we were talking about earlier about there's a lot of people who think that crypto is easy money, that it's easy to start a business and make a lot of money in crypto. It's not. I see people every day. It requires a lot of planning. There's a lot of work to do. Sometimes a lot of legal work has to go on for these businesses. To do it right and to make money in crypto in Canada is challenging. It's not easy. And I have a lot of respect for my entrepreneur clients who do this. It's hard. But I think a lot of regulators, the public, they think, oh, this is the world of easy money. And that might be true in the speculation side on cryptocurrency or the more negative side about international scams and things like that. But in the real build a business, an actual thing that has real customers in Canada for virtual currency, it's not easy. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's is uh, what's it uh, like chewing glass and staring into the abyss. <laughs> I don't know if it's that negative. I mean, this, my client's pretty positive people probably wouldn't say they're chewing glass, but it's, uh, it's hard, right? Like this, it's not easy. I don't think any startup is easy, but this space in particular, because of the complexity of the legal side sometimes, but also even the technical side, understanding it. People think it's easy to set up a wallet. Well, maybe creating a wallet's not too hard, but what about the backend nodes? How do you keep them up to date and go multi-coin and all of these kinds of things, right? But people don't think that. They assume mm. this stuff is all, it's all easy and there's lots of money here. Yeah, yeah, definitely can attest to that. And then that same question, maybe as it pertains to the world at large, like, you know, just given kind of the current context of the world, anything that you, you maybe, I don't know, kind of believe to be true that, that most others might disagree with you on? It could be anything non-Bitcoin or whatever related. That's a really tough one. I have a bunch of kind of contrarian opinions. But, what do you uh, want to roll with or you want to save that one for for next one oh uh, maybe, maybe we should do another one they'll they'll take okay, let, let's see that one but for even, the next one even what we were talking about today this talk about law and what's real and what's not in law and enforceability oh dude pe we, people don't think this this is not I don't, common I mean, knowledge this, this has been super yeah this is super so interesting I, I think even me. this whole talk here is i, I think we're, something i, I, I believe think... that most people don't I, I, you know, I mean, I might be like me, you and like five other people, but I, I feel like what we're talking about is really at the edge of, of what needs to be talked about. Cause it's not just about like ones and zeros. Like it's about ones and zeros as it pertains to the world and like our understanding crypto of it. really is the sharp end of that, right? It makes these things apparent. Mm. It's the same things as people talking about money. And I've even given talks. I'm not the part of to talk about what is money, but I've seen it. And all these people from professional regulators and things, you can see all these accountants, lawyers and things. Oh yeah, what is money? <laughs> you know, like people hardly ever question the basic things in our society, right? You know, it doesn't really come up very often. But in crypto, Ooh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People no, no, that, you really yeah, think about yeah, yeah. them. Oh no, 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 no. That 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 is the question that got me here. Like that is why after eight years I'm still super charged about you know Bitcoin and and what it might mean because I find like that is that all eternal the question that you know crosses color, age, religion, politics, the borders. I mean, it is. It is the one thing that everybody, when you ask, what is money? They stop. 
like whatever they're doing, their ears perk up, they listen. But then when you ask them, like, what is it? Nobody has an answer. And everybody, when they finally come to an answer, it's something different from the person before. So we have no definition that's, of the thing Charlie, that everybody's running after by design. <laughs> Charlie complexity. Our world is beyond the understanding of anyone. With 7 billion people in the world, mm. it's of course beyond their understanding. But people rely on like simple narratives about things that are normally fine, these abstractions, right? You never need to know them. But then when you really look at them, you see how complicated they are. Mm. Like, how does the economy work? I have no <laughs> idea. There's 40 million people nearly in Canada and 7 billion in the world, and they're all a part of the economy, right? Like how it works is everyone. Like it's, it's too complicated for mm. people. Mm. But that kind of an answer is not very satisfying to people either. And instead you have short forms like the economy. But what is that? That's, that's everything, right? Yeah, man. Okay, I said, and before I let you go, any any questions that you kind of wish I'd asked uh, that I maybe didn't? I know we covered a lot of ground, but it always feels like with you, uh, like we're there's never enough time. But uh, <laughs> we should definitely do this again. But we'll, we'll, we'll do another one. Okay. Um, but yeah, let, let's do that again. Because I, 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 there was a couple of different things I wanted to talk about, but we never really got to, to dive in. But let's do that again. So maybe in the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll figure out a time. So with that said, maybe I'll bring this one to a close here.